evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with all of us. And we appreciate your time and taking time out to be with the Teaching Fellows Institute and Barbara Oakley. And with that, I'm going to start and just tell you a little bit about Barbara. And then I know you're going to be letting us know what you'd like to talk about with respect to her most recent book, Uncommon Sense Teaching. Barbara is a professor of engineering, and she's worked in many different places and ha has done many different things, serving as a Russian translator on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea, teaching in China, going from the U.S. Army private to a regular Army captain, and also working as a radio operator in the South Pole Station in the Antarctic, where she met her husband. She had to go to the ends of the earth to meet him, which I think is very romantic as we come very close to Valentine's Day tomorrow. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we'd like to hear a little bit about the direct teaching method. Okay, so why don't I start with that? And then, uh, oh, and we've got another, let's see, one of your group work suggestions seem to be for long-term pro uh, projects are very rigid based on the idea of rules. I found a lot of success in doing quick time-sensitive in-class group activities with less rigidity. Uh, was the rigidity intentional based on specific research or was it based on the lack of space to talk about other group work methods? It was based on lack of space to talk about other group work methods. So um, there's a, a paper I wrote, I think it was back in 2003 or so, um, it's called Turning Student Groups into Effective Teams. And it talks about some of the more uh, regimented ways for long-term, you know, like full semester projects that we frequently experience in the engineering discipline. But of course, there's like, you know, think, pair, share, um, lots of different kinds of activities that you can do uh, as a group. And so, ooh, oh, this is like so fun. Okay. Um, Students have within their brains, they have this framework of, um, of all the connected neurons that have to do with your learning or with the student's learning. And these connected neurons are in long-term memory. So if you look here, this represents the framework of learning that students have, uh, have put into their long-term memory because you've helped teach them this information or because they have learned it in life and in various other things. Notice with these four students here, they all have somewhat different long-term memories. There's different way, like each dot kind of represents a neuron. Each connection or each line between represents connections between those neurons. So what's going on is students have this framework of long-term memory called a schema. Students have different schemas because they all have different experiences, but they have some similarities because they've learned similar things. Now, what is happening when you are teaching your students is those students, let's see if I can get this to come back here. Okay, see how these birds are all kind of flocking in a similar way? You what? what is happening during the learning process is you're trying to get your students to all have their, their kind of their thoughts in neural synchrony. And those, so you can see here, here's a student team where their thoughts are all in synchrony, except for this person who gets to mind wandering. This is the great thing about teamwork is the other students can get their thoughts aligned. And we can actually see in some of the great new imaging processes that are occurring, how students and teachers come into neural synchrony as the information is being learned. 
So some of that information being learned is they're pulling it from long-term memory. Others, they're sharing from the, within a group, for example, in order to all kind of get the right ideas, the ideas that you are trying to teach those students. So let's, let's go back. Here's, here's a teacher, this is you. You have information, you have thoughts in your mind. And those thoughts are partly pulled from your long-term memory, right? They're, they're partly built from that. And what you're trying to do is share those thoughts, that mental model with your students so that your students come into neural synchrony with you. Now, that's, that's part of what you're doing as a teacher is getting them to be in neural synchrony, but that's part of what student groups are doing as well. What they are doing is they're actually um, kind of, um, see, you're talking to them, and as you're speaking with them, you're sharing, they're developing a mental model, and that mental model is partly pulled from the schema of background information that they already have, and partly from what you're sharing. So if, if you um, like look again at our, our social learning um, uh, image here, Notice that the students have different background memories, and that means they can they can bring in different ideas, it, you know, into that mental model, and they can help each other. So I'll give you a sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, so if you um, let's see, come back here, if um, well, when we're teaching students, we're attempting to kind of tweak their long-term memory. That's, we'd love to be able to crawl in and actually tweak it, you know, uh, physically, but we can't. So we're trying to encourage them to change what's going on in their long-term memory by, um, by actually changing that schema. Of, of information. So, um, so as students are learning, here's the kind of thing that is happening. You are uh, like talking about electrons and electron flow. So me as a teacher, I know electrons. So I'm, I'm pulling that information from my schema. But the student, doesn't have a schema about electrons if you're talking about current and electron flow. So they may think of crowds of people as and pull that idea from their long-term memory and share that with another student. But notice, ultimately, even though they're pulling different ideas from long-term memory, they're actually able to all get in sync with the same ideas. So um, when you know, when students are learning, they're, they're, when you're working in a team situation, even short term, five minutes, what they're doing is they're sharing with some of these ideas that they have about, um, you know, uh, their, uh, that they're pulling from their schemas, they're getting one another on track, and they're all getting in neural sync with the ideas that you're trying to teach. So hopefully this is making sense to you. Um, I, I don't often go on the fly like this. Usually I present very sequentially and very logically, but since you've already read the book, I think you have some ideas uh, about uh, you know, what, is, um, what is going on in the brain during the learning process. So I think it's, hopefully okay to kind of charge ahead here. So when you're doing this very short exercise with students of asking them to think about what you've just taught, then 
pair up together and share about it. Often what happens, this is a wonderful technique, but what we often do is we feel uncomfortable with that momentary, like a minute or two of silence while they're thinking. So we often just jump right ahead to the pair and the share because we think that, oh, the students sharing together is the most important part of this active exercise. But what I want you to do is notice here's working memory. And working memory, what it is doing, it's taking information in from the outside. And then, so there's working memory, it's taking that information in. It's putting that information towards long-term memory through the hippocampus. This is declarative learning. Now watch, see what happens is that hippocampus can only offload the information you've just taught into long-term memory by when you are not getting any more new information into working memory. So notice, no information is going into working memory. The teacher is just standing there. Hippocampus can turn, so to speak, metaphorically, to the neocortex, uh, long-term memory, and reinforce that information that has just been taught. It can only do that when you're not speaking and when the student is not speaking. So information comes into the hippocampus, then the hippocampus can refresh and offload. Information goes into the hippocampus, then the hippocampus can turn and offload. When this is done enough, you don't even need that hippocampus anymore. That information can flow freely from working memory to long-term memory quite nicely and easily. You don't need that hippocampus. But again, during these active learning processes uh, where you're having students do very short kind of working together sessions, like five, you know, three to five minutes of think, pair, share, or actively talking together, a little bit of time where they can think before they share is a great thing to do. So um, let me go back and I'll answer this, or I'll bring up another um, issue that was brought up during, um, uh, in the questions there. So hey, let's Excuse go. me, Barbara. Can I just mention, um, Lisa, um, one of our teachers, um, wrote into the chat that she really likes the idea of built-in mini breaks, and she teach, teaches high school math and feels like the quick students are getting unplanned mini breaks while we wait for some of the slower students, slower in quotes, um, to complete the problem solving. What constitutes a mini break and how can we ensure that all students are benefiting from a break? And that made me think the way you're talking about how students need time when the teacher's not speaking to kind of move that memory, move that information from the hippocampus into long-term memory. Is that does that relate? Am I um, is that does well, that relate to what you were just talking about? Yes, they are. The the bottom line is if if you do not have, if your student does not have as big a working memory capacity, and I count myself amongst those with lesser working memory capacity, we need more time to process. So, because our, our little working memories don't like, you know, it's, we can only hold three things at once. So it takes us longer to pull in that information, whereas someone with like, a lot of arms on their attentional octopus, they can um, hold a lot of information and really put, move things into long-term memory much more quickly. How do you get everyone um, to ensure that they're all caught up? You, you can't. There isn't a perfect methodology 
um, for, you know, I mean, as long as you're reaching 90% of your students, you're, you're doing a great job as a teacher. Um, but it's, it's clear that those with lesser capacity working memory need more time to practice with the materials. But here's the great thing is those individuals can actually learn the information more deeply. So, um, so let me just um, show you a little bit of what I mean by, by that. Students have differing baths of neurochemicals, right? And some students are gonna have, um, well, when they're learning, when students are learning, a slower learner often is someone who does not have the, the bath of neurochemicals to hold those dendritic spines in place to help them make those connections. So here's an example. I am a slow learner. This is my brain. I go over my Spanish vocabulary words in the morning. By the afternoon, all those new vocabulary learn words that I thought I'd learned, well, many of them fall away because those little dendritic spines are washed away because I don't have a really good memory. Oh, I rue the fact that I don't have a good memory. Yet, here's, here's what someone with a really good memory, and these, these are often very fast learners. They'll learn that vocabulary list in the morning, in the afternoon, they've maybe forgotten a word. So they have a bath of neurochemicals that holds those dendritic spines and those connections in place much more swiftly or much more easily than the slower learner like me. So here I am, I go tomorrow morning and I study my Spanish vocabulary list. And as I study it, I reconfigure those neurons those dendritic spines, but they're in a slightly different configuration. Well, what's the deal with that? It means I can be more flexible in what I'm thinking. Although my brain doesn't lock in to my learning, at the same time, I'm not locked in to what I've learned, which means I can be more flexible. If I'm wrong about something that I've jumped to the conclusion about, I can more easily and flexibly change my mind. So, uh, so there's the um, kind of uh, slower learners. Um, what what can really happen is uh, let's let's talk about working memory capacity just a little bit more. And so here we go. Let's say that we have someone like Terry Sanowski, who's got a race car brain, my co-author, he's super smart, very large working memory capacity. So, uh, so when Terry gets something, um, what can happen is he gets this information in working memory, yeah, um, and my bridge should go forward, ah, and, the, that information is like they're like these little um, connected clusters of neurons. That's the information that you're learning, and um, he can put that easily into long-term memory. He's got a lot of arms on his working memory octopus, and it's easy for him to uh, to learn new things, and. Um, as that information is put into long-term memory, it can consolidate, connect together. You can pull back bigger pieces of information. So what about somebody like me, who is like, you know, I've got a lesser capacity working memory. What that, mean, what that means is I can take in smaller bits of information. I can put it into long-term memory. Once it gets, it takes me longer to get that information into long-term memory. But once I've got it into long-term memory, just like with Terry, I can consolidate that information and I can pull bigger chunks into long-term memory, uh, into working memory. 
So, so this is why having more practice, having more time can help. Um, sponge activities where you're allowing students to do a few other things during those little breaks that can, the, the really fast learners, that can help them um, with these kinds of things. But, but allowing students to have that little bit of break time where they're cogitating, where they can really think about what, they're, what, what you've just taught uh, is invaluable. And it can be valuable even for those who are, you know, not only uh, lesser capacity and slower learners like me, but also for faster learners. Um, so let's see, should, uh, so uh, let me pause here um, and just ask if there's any questions. And if there are not, then I can go on to talk about direct instruction. Like this, so it says uh, something else I've done um, uh, that Sarah notes is uh, a lot of breaks where I put them in pairs so you can pair the hiker up with a race car and when they get uh, then they get back and they can work on the problems together. I think that works great. Sometimes I will deliberately pair race cars with race cars and hikers with hikers though, just because. Um, Hikers can end up depending more on the race cars. And uh, sometimes it can be really surprising how good the hikers can be when they are really forced to do, uh, you know, do it on their, or uh, do it between themselves. So a little bit of mixing up, but I'm sure you do that as it is. Uh, let's see. One thing to note, just if anyone's looking for a great strategy for that, if you use flippity.net, and use their, they have a wheel that's like a randomizer. So it's just flippity.net. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that I like about it is it puts, you can put them in groups, like according to two, you know, groups of two groups of three. But what I like about it is if you have the tab open with their names on it, you can actually switch who's in what group and then go back to the wheel and so then when you click on the random groups, you've actually pre-done them, but it doesn't look like you did. So the kids are all like, oh, that's who the computer gave me without knowing that you did it. So just play around with that because that's a really, I mean, that's like a prime teacher hack there. Flippity.net. Oh, that's great. I'll have to go take a look at that. One thing, so um, let's see. So um, let's see. Uh, one individual direct messaged and said that uh, she teaches at uh, at a school with um, project and collaborative based uh, learning, and she thinks her students could benefit from uh, being introduced to some of the neuroscience behind teamwork and working memory. Are there lessons or materials to lead these uh, social um, emotional learning lessons for students? There is so much. If you go to Uncommon Sense Teaching on Coursera, um, um, so there's a specialization there, and that has three different massive open online courses. There, there's. Let me show you the hack, so that um, I can I can kind of show you a partial hack, so you can get in for free. Um, and let's see here. Okay, so if you look here on this uncommon sense teaching specialization, uh, notice five star review. So there's three courses in the specialization. If you go to the individual courses, and it, it won't happen for me because I I like am already I think logged in and so forth. Um, but if you go there or go, you know, within each one and then say, it says enroll for, for free, but then it comes up with some kind of, uh, you know, pop-up box. On that pop-up box, select audit, which is at the bottom of the pop-up box. And that will allow you to get into virtually all the materials. Only some of the quizzes are not available. But you will see underneath each um, uh, of the um, uh, videos, there's uh, a PowerPoint presentation 
And so let's see if I can go to that. I'll we'll go into the course here. And now you see my back end here. Um, so you will see that, for example, um, oh, you can see I failed my own quiz. Um, let's see, here's the imposter syndrome. In um, underneath, see where it says download? You can download the videos. You can use them to teach in class. You can download uh, the transcript. You can, um, but the big thing is, oh, there's a PowerPoint that you can use. And for all of the materials in the course, there's all the animations and so forth. So what I found is that, for example, when I was in Cutter, uh, the, they used uh, learning how to learn materials in their um, AP biology courses to help students learn how to learn effectively. So the first three days of this biology course, they were learning about neurons, uh, neuroplasticity, learning the Pomodoro technique and all of these kinds of things. So they were learning how to learn prior to actually diving into the AP biology material. And what was a shocker for me was when I went there, um, the students found it so powerful that I I felt like Britney Spears. I was being followed by hundreds of students around the school as I was, you know, and it was like, so they had to spirit me out the back. But students can find this information so incredibly useful. And what's really important is that the, for example, OECD, which does the PISA tests uh, and the World Economic Forum, they have realized that learning how to learn is an essential skill. So if you look at this, the top 10 essential skills for 2015, learning isn't on them. Learning how to learn isn't there. 2020, learning how to learn isn't there. 2025, learning how to learn is, is the number two most important skill in um, that is thought to be necessary. And schools are going there. It's already in the works to begin examining schools as to whether they are teaching students not just materials, but how to learn effectively. So uh, whether learning how to learn itself is in the instructional materials. So I think that schools can really benefit uh, by getting ahead of the curve and starting to teach about these things. And what's, what's invaluable, I think, is, and the reason that learning how to learn is suddenly leaping to the fore is that we now know how the brain works, how we learn. And in last, in previous decades, we have not known that. So there was a lot of information about to, how to learn, but there was also a lot of misinformation about how to learn effectively. But now we're really um, homing in on you know, what does make for good learning for students. And that's something we can really share with our students. Okay, so that uh, is Julius Yigo. And Julius is from Kenya. If you know anything about Kenya, you know they're very famous for their long distance runners. But if you look at Julia's arm, his arms, it's clear he is not a long distance runner. And indeed, he always wanted to learn how to throw the javelin. And so he couldn't afford to um, you know, go overseas and study. There were no javelin throwing coaches in all of Kenya. So he began watching YouTube videos. And what what happened was he, by looking at these YouTube videos and then going out and practicing on his own, he became the world champion in throwing the javelin, which tells you, A, that online learning is not bad, um, especially when you have real good teachers. Uh, but B, it also uh, gives you insight into the learning process itself. Um, Julius was a very, very perceptive individual. If we look at the history of learning, I mean, for 
thousands of years practically, we thought that the only way you learned was when people were lecturing you. And there is something to that. But in the last 50 years or so, a lecture has gone out of fashion as we've become more aware that students actively learning and grappling with the material is important to be doing. But um, the problem is that now we've taken the pendulum all the way to the other side and said, oh, the only way students learn is active uh, through active learning when they're working with the material. But that's not true either. I mean, how does a student know what to learn without some kind of instructional materials? You might say, oh, active learning. Yeah, well, turn them loose with the book. Well, they're getting the instructional materials through a book. Um, it, a lot of times, it's, it's much more effective to have that elevator speech from a teacher of the most important things and then let them go after working with the materials themselves. So a little bit of lecture, exposition, uh, a little bit of active learning, or you know, maybe a lot of active learning, or maybe even you know, an even mixture of lecture and active learning. Uh, we don't really know what, we, we do know that a mixture of lecture and active learning seems to be what's needed. And what I find really interesting, for example, I was looking recently at an article in Science, and they talked about active learning in the STEM classroom and how vitally important it is that they had robots to do um, some of the ancillary, whenever students got off track, um, they could get the, the students back on track. But the whole idea was that students were learning actively through the class. But that's really not true. That's not what they were doing. If robots were helping a little bit and coaching sometimes, they were actually doing a mixture of some exposition when the student needed the lecture and some active learning. So this mixture is often what takes place in the best classrooms, you know, depending of course on the curriculum. But this mixture is called direct instruction. And direct instruction is, is really, you know, that, I mean, there's just so much uh, that we know about why direct instruction is so powerful. Um, I have a, a very good animation of, Let's see, where is that? Um, let's, uh, let's go here. So in the, um, in 67 through 77, so nearly at 10 years, there was a large scale study done that showed that of all the instructional techniques that were tested, direct instruction was by far the best. And this, this, immense study with hundreds of thousands of students and tens of thousands of teachers costing on the order of a hundred million dollars was never published because it went against the zeitgeist of constructivism. And in actuality, it shouldn't be perceived that way because direct instruction is not just sitting there lecturing. It is a mixture of well, some lecture but very much integrated in that is active learning itself. So, uh, so I think we're coming around now, we're beginning to realize that we need that, that mixture of, you know, we as teachers are important. We shouldn't be discounted, um, and, but you know, we also need to ensure that students are actively grappling with the material themselves. So that was a, a really, I think a, a very interesting point. Um, and hopefully this addresses the, uh, the, the question that was brought up. Barbara, I don't notice if you, if you noticed from Sarah, she said she really loved this part of your book and she notes that she sees a lot of downplaying of, of lecture, but her students often, desire more lecture and they, they actually crave direct instruction and she really appreciates you highlighting the research on this to help her um, 
boost uh, what she'd like to do in the classroom, what her students would like her to do in the classroom. So thanks very much for that, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, it's my pleasure. Um, is it's it's kind of funny, but um, I, I do think that um, you know that direct instruction is just uh, it's kind of what we always naturally do, and or most teachers naturally do this, and. So I have to talk just a little bit about my own two daughters. So as a professor of engineering, um, and like Barbara, an electrical engineer, I really wanted our two daughters to be, um, be you know, to be capable in today's technological world. And the thing is that um, little girls, are often slightly verbally advanced over little boys. It's just the nature of there's there's there they develop more quickly verbally. And most I think parents of uh, of little girls will will uh, affirm that they're quite gifted comparatively or you know more gifted um, verbally. And so when we tell little girls follow your passion. Passions develop about what you're good at. And so um, what little girls often are very good at is verbally related skills. So I wanted our daughters to feel as capable analytically as they were verbally. And certainly they were verbally quite capable. Um, so I had my daughters, uh, I enrolled them in a program called Kuma Mathematics which allows uh, for extra practice in a very well thought out interleaving way. And uh, for a long time, sadly, um, Kuman has been an anathema for many who, uh, who are you know, from certain schools of education in mathematics. But since I was a professor of engineering, I knew how you learn. Um, in STEM, all my colleagues, um, most of my colleagues grew up in countries like China, the Middle East, uh, India, where you have these kinds of, um, you know, interleaved uh, practice and extra practice, uh, particularly with math. So, uh, so I had our daughters would do this extra 20 minutes or so of math practice a day. And our older daughter, was terrible at math. And she really used that extra practice. I mean, because just to stay at grade level, she needed that. But at the same time, she became very comfortable with math. And so she is now, she did her medical residency at Stanford. She's a very gifted pediatrician. That's exactly what she wanted to be. Our younger daughter, um, you know, she just hated math. That was it. She just hated it. So every day was kicking and screaming for 20 minutes, you know, on the days when I did that, which was most days. And um, she became an artist. And then she went out and worked in the world of art and um, went back to graduate, graduate school and got her master's degree in statistics. And now she loves her work. And, and that extra background in math through the years made an enormous difference in her capabilities. I met the, the son of her graduate advisor when I was in Vietnam. And he, he told me, he said, my, my father never usually takes on American schooled uh, uh, graduate students because they just don't feel comfortable with math. But your daughter was different. And it's that little bit of extra practice, I think, that made it a big difference for her. Other questions? So Barbara, I was, I'm just curious in terms of this little extra practice for teachers, like that was you doing that as a parent, would there be a way to implement that little bit of extra practice without it being a burden in the classroom or any thoughts on that area? Sure. Um, so it depends a lot on the flexibility of the school. But for example, I went into the Pont inner urban school district of Pontiac and implemented an extra 20 minutes of math a day with the Kuman program. And do you know that 
um, the, the elementary schools that I worked with went from no child um, meeting state norms to a significant percentage, like 60% meeting state norms and then some exceeding state norms in mathematics. So it was just a, a little program where they did a little extra 20 minutes of practice a day with math and it, it made a big difference. This was at the uh, K-5 level. So it, it would depend a lot on your school and, you know, and what the flexibility is. Uh, but a little bit of extra practice makes um, makes a big difference. If you look at um, Will Emeny, uh, has some great uh, materials for math where you can have students do a little bit of quick practice. And you will hear sometimes from educators who are not in the know that, oh, you never wanna stress your students. Um, and that that actually hurts their ability to learn because um, if you're never stressed, there's there's like this curve. Never stressed, you fall asleep. Too much stress, you can't learn. A little stress, you get that extra cortisol, and it makes it easier to learn. So if you have like speed, a little bit of speed tests and so forth, what that does is that just helps with automaticity, which helps with all sorts of things through that math progression or whatever you're learning. Um, it's just like playing a musical instrument. You don't want to always just go slowly through. You gradually learn to speed to the appropriate tempo when you're learning a foreign language. If you don't have the stress of having to speak to an, uh, a native speaker of the language you're trying to learn, it's actually, it's more difficult to learn the language. But if you're speaking with that other person, it can be stressful, but you will learn it more quickly. And you also gain that automaticity, that swiftness with the language. So, uh, you know, a little bit of stress, uh, a little bit of practice to make sure that you really, you've kind of overlearned things. And it's it would make it so that you, um, you put those sets of links into your procedural habitual memory, and then you can use them without burdening your working memory. It's like you can do this stuff kind of in the background, but you can hold more information in your mind because you're not having to, you know, fiddle with all the 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 background information because your habitual learning centers are doing are handling it. Oh, okay, so Sarah says, um, you talked in the book about habit formation in classroom procedures, uh, but I didn't see many uh, end notes that talk about this uh, connection specifically. I'm interested in knowing what research is being done uh, in neuroscience and habit formation, specifically in character building habits and formation, not task habits. Are there any resources or researchers you can recommend to dive into this or just any search terms. Um, so I would, the, the first thing, I, so I'm intensely interested in character formation. So if you look in the second MOOC of the Uncommon Sense Teaching uh, Specialization, I, we were able to go much more in depth about character development what you can do with character development in the classroom, what you cannot do with character development in the classroom. And there are copious, copious references in the reading. Um, one thing to realize, like if you go and look, like let's say you go look at, I don't know if you saw the recent uh, documentary on Bernie Madoff. Um, he was um, kind of a sociopath. Uh, on Wall Street. He went through the same educational system that a lot of other really decent people went through, but he turned out quite differently. Why? Um, can we change that? Um, 
that's, I think, a very, very good question. And I think you're trying to dive deep into something that is super important, but that at the same time, we must realize that when we're teaching about, you know, behavior and how to act, we are preaching to the choir. So in other words, we're the, the ones who listen to us are the ones that we really kind of don't need to be teaching so much. The ones who don't listen to us are the ones we most need to reach, and those are the hardest to reach. So is that where, sorry to just unmute, but I feel like I would type too much. Is that where like you <clears throat> talk about the procedural learning being like doing, right? A lot more of that and a lot more of just practice of those things instead of like, I'm telling you, right? Is, is that my understanding is, is that off of like, versus like the, um, where's your chart in here? So I need to go back to, um, but in terms of character formation, is a lot of what we do declarative versus procedural, I guess would be the question. Like, is that, is that a lot of what the research is focused on? Like how we present thinking about our social emotional aspects of our curriculum and how they're presented to the kids. Um, very perceptive question. What we're doing when we're talking about procedural learning in the classroom is we're talking about habitual things like um like what do you do you know when you need to go to the bathroom how do you react when someone else um you know poses a question we're not talking about i mean i do not see a way that through teaching in the procedural system that we can change a person's character if they um might have, for example, malevolent intentions. So I think that's a that's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very different kettle of fish. Um, and would that we could solve it that way. Um, it, it's that's a very intractable problem. Um, and one thing to just be aware of is simply that when you think you are making an impact on a student, for example, um, let's see, um, Harris of the, uh, you know, of the Columbine killings, he just said everything that they, they wanted to hear. So they thought he's just doing fine. Um, and so, you know, the ones you most want to reach, you have to be very careful because you think you've reached them when they're actually just parroting what you wanted, what they knew you wanted them to be saying. So my first book actually was called, it's a bit tongue in cheek, called Evil Genes, Evil Genes, why um, why Ron fell, Hitler rose, and Ron failed, and my sister stole my mother's boyfriend. And it, it was about um, my oldest sister uh, was really quite a malevolent character. And I was trying to figure out why, why would she do these kinds of things? And, um, you know, there's, there's some indication that, like, if you have an antisocial personality, and you are from a, a, a disadvantaged family, the, it is more likely that the environment has helped shape the malevolent kind of personality that you might be. If you are from a well-to-do family, there's more evidence that biology shapes the kind of malevolent behavior that you might have. So uh, both environment and biology can weigh in. Uh, there's something called borderline personality disorder, which is, uh, you know, it's a very, very difficult uh, where an individual can be extremely charismatic. Uh, they can show you whatever you are looking for, uh, and then they can turn around and, you know, be, uh, be the kind of person who's a, a bully in the classroom and really create problems. And you can't see it because when you talk to them, it's all invisible. So, uh, you know, how do you fix those kinds of issues? That's a, that's a, 
really tough question. So I have to ask, normally I, um, I give a fixed presentation and I had to kind of shuttle around a little bit because, you know, it's hard to kind of pull anything up on the fly, but which would you rather have had? Would you have preferred a fixed presentation or did you like this kind of more free form uh, format? Any thoughts from folks? I'm a free form kind of person. I haven't done this before. So it was like, no, let's try something, you know, especially since you, you have mostly kind of seen the book, uh, I hope, and uh, discussed it a little bit. Uh, it's, I'm just so excited about learning and education and what lies in the future because I feel like we're really making breakthroughs now in understanding how to help students learn more effectively. And I, I just love what lies ahead for teachers, what lies ahead for students. Um, I, I think we have some wonderful things going on on the horizon. Well, I think we're having a lot of people saying they really appreciated the free form approach, Barb. And also it's harder, I think, if you, you know, because you have to go on the fly, it's a little risky, so you have to take a chance. So we have, we appreciate you taking that risk. Okay, so, oh, Sarah asked, oh, what's your favorite book you've ever written? Um, I've read Learning How to Learn for My Kids and love this one, which is my favorite. I'll tell you which one is my husband's favorite is Hair of the Dog, um, Tales from Aboard a Russian Trawler. Uh, he, he really loves that book. So, um, and it's basically about getting drunk all the time on Russian trawlers. So maybe that's why, um, but it was a fun book to write. Um, I think my favorite one, to be honest, uh, is Uncommon Sense Teaching. Uh, it was really hard to write because when you're trying to get a neuroscientist, a teacher, and an engineer together, like I would be talking to Beth and going, well, you know, this is procedural learning. And she'd be saying, yes, we follow these procedures. And finally, you know, it's like, you no know, procedure, following procedures is declarative learning through the hippocampus. Um, and procedural learning is actually procedural, you know, through the basal ganglia system. So the two terminologies are directly counterposing to one another. And there's like lots of, uh, of kind of incidents like that where uh, one, like a neuroscientist thinks one way, a teacher thinks another way, and then I'm sitting there trying to figure out what the heck. It, it does make me laugh because sometimes teachers will say, oh, those darn neuroscientists, they got all their jargon. No, they, they don't share with us. They don't like make it so we can understand what they're talking about. And I'm thinking, guess what? The teaching discipline does the same thing. You have so much jargon, you know, that actually it takes some decoding to uh, to convey it, for example, to, to parents. Um, you know, what is a formative assessment? Why, did, why is that term used? Um, and so I think the book in Common Sense Teaching is, is a good book because it, it, it just kind of breaks things down that teachers sometimes take for granted and and but also puts it in terms where it's it relates to the underlying neuroscience and it also is said in a way that even parents can understand um, you know what teachers are doing which is awesome but sometimes a little bit difficult to decode so um, let's see Okay, so uh, let's see. Any other questions? I think, we, oh, let's see. Oh, Matthew Davidson was our speaker when we delved into character as website here. Uh, um, uh, and you'll find much more on character in, um, in MOOC uh, 2 of Uncommon Sense Teaching with Specialization. And it's all stuff that's like way beyond what, I, what was in the Uncommon Sense Teaching book. 
also in the Uncommon Sense Teaching Specialization MOOC 2 is a lot about neurodiversity that was not put into the book. So we talk about, uh, for example, uh, those with dyslexia, those with, um, with, uh, who are on the spectrum. Uh, how does that relate to, um, to what we know about the basal ganglia and the declarative hippocampal learning systems? It relates very strongly to that. So, uh, so, uh, so there's a lot more information in the uh, online course that, that digs deeper and builds out on what's in Uncommon Sense Teaching the Book. And, and I'll note that in my follow-up email tomorrow, Barbara, so they, okay. they make sure to get that. That's the second MOOC. I've got it down here. <laughs> okay. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for your time today and to tonight. Uh, thanks for being with us. And I know all of our teachers really enjoyed your work and hopefully they've signed up for your newsletter on your website. If you haven't, I think you, oh, you, you so might want thing, to. Mm -hmm. The thing to do is to go, my, my newsletter is go to learning how to learn okay. on Coursera. And, um, and then if you just register for the course, the registration is free. And, you know, so like they'll say, get a certificate, just say, no, I don't want it. The registration is free. And then you will always get my, you know, every, every other week or every month or so, I send out a chilly Friday email and it goes out to about 3 million people now. So wow. okay. that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> And it's just about various insights related to learning. Well, we're all going to look forward to your next book, Barbie. Do you want to share with us what the title or topic of that next book is going to be? Oh, well, right now I'm working on a specialization for Coursera on the neuroscience of critical thinking. Okay. So uh, it's critical thinking, creative thinking, um, and um, sort of being productive uh, all uh, from a leadership perspective. So it's, uh, it's exciting. And um, uh, I, I will go back and work on that. This evening. Okay, great. Well, we'll let you go to that. And I, you'll probably have, it looks like you probably have a good number of students ready to sign up for that right here when, when it comes out. So, so once again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, Barbara. Once again, th thanks again. And uh, everyone, thanks for being here. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again soon.